Our scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. A look at Lord's Day 30 of the Heidelberg Catechism. So 1 Corinthians 11 and Lord's Day 30. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 17, the word of the living God. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. Among About the other things, I will give directions when I come. May God bless the reading of his word. And now let's look at Lord's Day 30 of the Heidelberg Catechism. I will read the question. Let us respond together with the answer. Question 80. How does the Lord's Supper differ from the Roman Catholic Mass? Answer. The Lord's Supper declares to us that all our sins are completely forgiven through the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which he himself accomplished on the cross once for all. It also declares to us that the Holy Spirit grafts us into Christ, who with his true body is now in heaven at the right hand of the Father, where he wants us to worship him. But the Mass teaches that the living and the dead do not have their sins forgiven through the suffering of Christ, unless Christ is still offered for them daily by the priests. It also teaches that Christ is bodily present under the form of bread and wine, where Christ is therefore to be worshiped. Thus, the Mass is basically nothing but a denial of the one sacrifice and suffering of Jesus Christ and a condemnable idolatry. Question 81, who should come to the Lord's table? Answer, those who are displeased with themselves because of their sins, but who nevertheless trust that their sins are pardoned and that their remaining weakness is covered by the suffering and death of Christ, and who also desire more and more to strengthen their faith and to lead a better life. Hypocrites and those who are unrepentant, however, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Question 82, should those be admitted to the Lord's Supper who show by what they profess and how they live that they are unbelieving and ungodly? Answer, no, that would bring dishonor God's covenant and bring down God's wrath upon the entire congregation. Therefore, according to the instruction of Christ and his apostles, the Christian church is duty bound to exclude such people by the official use of the keys of the kingdom until they reform their lives. So we continue our look at the Lord's Supper in the Heidelberg Catechism. When we examine something closely, we need contrast. Contrast is essential. If, in order to see an object fully, we need to contrast it with something else. 
The common example is a diamond on a cloth of black velvet. You go to the jeweler, he sets the diamond on the glass counter, you can't really see it. He puts the black velvet cloth down, the diamond lays on top. Now you see the diamond in the contrast with the black velvet cloth. So the same is true for us in order to get a full picture of the Reformed doctrine of the Lord's Supper, the biblical doctrine. The Heidelberg Catechism contrasts the biblical doctrine with the false doctrine of the Roman Catholic Mass. You might wonder why is this included in our catechism. That is the point, to contrast the true doctrine with the false doctrine. The truth stands out more clearly when it is contrasted with darkness. So as we've gone through the catechism, looking at the Lord's Supper, we see that the bread and wine are the body and blood of Christ sacramentally. They're not literally the body and blood. Their substances do not change, but they are the body and blood sacramentally. The sign is so closely connected to that which is signified that the one can stand for the other. So Jesus can say, this is my body and this is my blood. The sign of the bread is so closely connected to his body. The sign of the blood is so, the sign of the, the wine is so closely connected to his blood that one can stand for the other. And again, we've seen the supper is an objective reality. It signifies and seals all of Christ's promises to us. Now, we look at question 80. Most Reformed people love the first two paragraphs of question 80, rightly so. They're packed with excellent theology on the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper declares to us that all our sins are completely forgiven through the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which he himself accomplished on the cross once for all. I've said before, the supper is the gospel made visible. The supper declares to us. We need to hear the preaching of the gospel, but we also need the gospel declared to us in the sacrament. We have a visible sign and seal that Christ has accomplished our salvation on the cross once for all. And notice this, once for all. This is key. We'll see that in a moment as we get to the Mass. Then the second paragraph, it also declares to us that the Holy Spirit grafts us into Christ, who with his true body is now in heaven at the right hand of the Father, where he wants us to worship him. So, here, the Catechism affirms that Christ's human body is in a specific location. His body is at the right hand of the Father. His body takes up a specific amount of space. His body has dimensions. His body is not omnipresent. His human body cannot be everywhere at the same time. It's in one place. His divinity, of course, is omnipresent. But his human body has one location, the right hand of the Father. And notice the Catechism says his true body is now in heaven at the right hand of the Father where he wants us to worship him. So Christ is our head. He's in heaven. We're united to Christ by the Spirit through faith. And so Paul says in Ephesians 2, we are seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So if Christ is in heaven... The Father wants us to worship him in heaven. So the Spirit takes us to Christ. And this is how we feed on his body and blood. We literally enter another world in the worship service. We enter into the throne room of God. He welcomes us into his presence. Through the sacrifice of Christ, we are welcomed as we're clothed in his righteousness, and we enter the very throne room of God. You enter another world every Lord's Day. Doesn't seem like it, maybe, externally. But in reality, in a spiritual way, we enter into the very throne room of heaven. This is why I've always said the greatest form of evangelism, of course, is the Lord's Day worship service. It's not street preaching. It's not passing out tracts. Those things may be well and good for what they're uh, intended for. But bring an unbeliever here, and it's an otherworldly experience 
And this is also why there's such a great tragedy with the seeker-sensitive worship services of the last generation or so that they've designed the worship service for the unbeliever. It's not for the unbeliever. It's for Christians. God welcomes us into his presence, into his very throne room. Unbelievers don't go there. So why would we structure our worship service for unbelievers? It defies the whole point of worship. Christ is in heaven. The Spirit takes us to heaven to worship him. Amazing. That's the good part. Now we come to the Mass, which is the opposite of the good part. The last portion of question 80. Now, this question is, without a doubt, the most controversial question in the entire Heidelberg Catechism. The Christian Reformed Church, our mother denomination, determined that question 80 can no longer be held in its current form as part of our confession. So they actually put brackets around the final three paragraphs of question 80 in their publication of the Heidelberg Catechism. So if you look at the CRC production of the Heidelberg Catechism, they don't delete it, but they put it in brackets. So you should know that they say, they do this to indicate that they do not ac accurately reflect the official teaching and practice of today's Roman Catholic Church and are no longer confessionally binding on members of the CRC. That's why they bracket it off. But as we'll see, this is the official practice of the Roman Catholic Church. Nothing has changed with Rome with regard to the Mass. The Reformed Church in America, which was the mother church of the CRC in our Dutch Reformed in America lineage, they retain the original full text, but they add a footnote in their version that says question 80 was altogether absent from the first edition of the catechism, but was present in a shorter form in the second edition. The translation here given is of the expanded text of the third edition. And they choose to recognize that the catechism was written within a historical context, which may not accurately describe the Roman Catholic Church's current state. So they're basically apologizing to Rome for this question. Is that what Rome believes? What we have contained in question 80? Let's talk about the Mass. Roman Catholic Catechism 1330. I'll give you the references here in case you want to explore them later. In 1994, the Roman Catholic Church for the first time produced a universal catechism. In its entire history, they never had a universal catechism. They're all it was uh, more parochial. Many Americans uh, who were raised Catholic used the Baltimore Catechism. One of my uh, Catholic friends said he would sit in his catechism class, bored out of his mind, and on the cover of the Baltimore Catechism was the state flag of Maryland, which, if you know, has a very intricate state flag. So he would copy the state flag while the, the priest is droning on about the catechism, trying to entertain himself in some way. But in 1994, the first time, John Paul II, Roman Catholic Catechism, universal. So when you're talking with your Roman Catholic friends, many, of course, American Catholics have a smorgasbord version of their Catholicism. I like this part. I'm going to leave that part behind. Maybe not so much infallibility of the Pope, those sorts of things. But the Roman Catholic Catechism is explicit. If you expect to be saved through the Roman Catholic Church, you must believe what's in the catechism. You don't get a choice. American Catholics don't get to pick and choose which parts they like. The whole thing is binding on them. So when you talk to your Catholic friends and neighbors, take them to the catechism. This is what your church believes. Whether or not you believe it is immaterial. This is what you must believe. And it's very accessible online. You can search it. They actually have a very nice website, Roman Catholic Catechism, uh, from the Vatican. Very easy to uh, navigate. They say of the Mass, it is called the Holy Sacrifice because it makes present the one sacrifice of Christ the Savior and includes the Church's offering, the terms Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, Sacrifice of Praise, Spiritual Sacrifice, Pure and Holy Sacrifice are also used since it completes and surpasses all the sacrifices of the Old Covenant. 
So the Mass is a sacrifice to God. That is absolutely clear. It is a sacrifice. The priest calls down Christ onto the altar. Incidentally, as I gesture toward our table, please don't uh, see me as pointing to an altar. This is not an altar. This is a table. <laughs> there is no sacrifice on this altar. For it to be an altar, there must be a sacrifice. We do not have a sacrifice on our table, merely a table. But in the Mass, it's an altar. On the altar, then, Christ's sacrifice is represented. The crucified Christ is offered as a sin offering to God in the Mass. The Mass is a sacrifice. And over and over in the Catechism, we see this language of offering in 1335. Sorry, 1350. Thirteen fifty. speaking of the liturgy of the Mass. Sometime in the procession, the bread and wine are brought to the altar. They will be offered by the priest in the name of Christ in the Eucharistic sacrifice in which they will become his body and blood. It is the very action of Christ at the Last Supper, taking the bread and a cup. The church alone offers this pure oblation to the Creator, and oblation is just a sacrifice when she offers what comes forth from his creation with thanksgiving. So this is an offering. The Mass is a sacrifice to God. Then in 1354, in the memorial that follows, the church calls to mind the passion, the resurrection, and the glorious return of Christ Jesus. She presents to the Father the offering of his Son, which reconciles us with him. So in every Mass, every day of the week, the Roman Catholic Church presents the offering of Christ, and they believe that that reconciles them to God. Without the Mass, there is no forgiveness of sins, says the Roman Catholic Church. And that's exactly what our catechism says. Our catechism says no different, nothing different than what the Roman Catholic Catechism says. Third paragraph, the Mass teaches that the living and the dead do not have their sins forgiven through the suffering of Christ unless Christ is still offered for them daily by the priests. Rome has not changed since this was written in 1563. And we'll see, they can't change. So the CRC, the RCA, who are trying to apologize for question 80, it's not only is it weakness, it's just wrong. Rome has not changed. We don't need to apologize for them. So the authors of the Catechism were aware, of course, of what the Mass was when they wrote it. They're writing in the immediate aftermath of the Council of Trent. Council of Trent. The Council of Trent was held in multiple sessions between 1545 and 1563. They didn't meet continuously over those years, but I think in three different occasions they gathered together over almost two decades. So just to put that in perspective, we typically date the start of the Reformation to October 31st, 1517. The first edition of the Institutes of the Christian Religion by John Calvin is produced in 1536. In 1546, Martin Luther dies. So that's where the timeline where this Council of Trent sits in the Protestant Reformation. And the Council of Trent was very much Rome's answer to the Protestant Reformation. From the beginning of the Reformation, Luther and the other reformers never set out to start a new church. They never set out to divide the church. What they did was repeatedly plead with the Pope to call a council. 
they begged the Pope to call a council to address their concerns. And the Reformation was two-pronged. It was moral and it was doctrinal. Moral corruption and doctrinal error. So they, they're pleading with the Pope, call a council, we have to address these things. Luther actually believed initially that the Pope was unaware of all the moral abuses that were going on in the church. He thought if the Pope only knew about this, he would do something about it. Luther also believed that he and the other Protestants could convince the Pope, as well as the teaching office of the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Magisterium, they could convince them of the doctrinal error within the church and could persuade them to accept the tenets of the Reformation, sola scriptura, sola fide, and so forth. This was their goal, to convince the Pope and the hierarchy of the church to repent of their moral abuse and to embrace doctrinal truth and reject the doctrinal error they've fallen into. So over these decades, again, 1517 all the way to 1545 is the calling of this council. Over these decades, they repeatedly asked the Pope to call a council. Finally, in 1545, Pope Paul III calls the council, but it's clear that he has no intention of hearing the Protestant concerns. He's not going to give a fair hearing to the moral and doctrinal issues raised by the Protestants. Now, to be fair to the Roman Catholic Church of that day, they did engage in some moral reform. They admitted there was great moral corruption in the church. They didn't reform as much as Luther and the other reformers would have liked, but they did engage in some moral reform. But the doctrinal positions that the Protestants laid out, that they set before the Pope and the Roman Catholic hierarchy, instead of embracing them, Instead of turning back to Scripture alone as their ultimate authority, rather they condemn these doctrinal positions and they condemn anyone who holds them. And so the reformers said, you have anathematized, you have condemned forever the gospel itself. And it's at the Council of Trent that the reformers gave up hope for a reformation of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church cut themselves off from the gospel when it condemned the gospel. And that's when the Protestants said, you are now a synagogue of Satan and the true church must continue elsewhere. So they convene in 1545. The initial sessions of the council address the issues of scripture, the doctrine of justification. Then in 1551, they pick up the question of the Eucharist. So in session 13, Chapter 1, you can find all these on Google. Very good English translations of the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent. Session 13, Chapter 1 says, In the first place, the Holy Synod teaches and openly and simply professes that in the sacred sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, after the consecration of the bread and wine, our Lord Jesus Christ, true God and true man, is truly, really, and substantially contained under the species of those sensible things, those sensible things being the bread and the wine. So the key words here, truly, really, and substantially, the body of Christ is contained. And we see that in the fourth paragraph of question 80. It also teaches that Christ is bodily present under the form of bread and wine, where Christ is therefore to be worshipped. The Catechism says exactly what the Council of Trent says about the Mass. In the Mass, the bread and the wine are transubstantiated into the body and blood of Christ. So the substance... The substance is changed. The substance is what makes something what it is. The substance of the bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood of Christ. But the accidents, 
remain the same. So the external characteristics, the accidents, the particular characteristics of something that are not essential to it, they're not part of the substance, these change. These remain the same, and this changes. So the accidents, draw a cup, piece of bread. The accidents remain the same. On the altar is wine and bread. Externally, physically, looks like bread, tastes like bread. But the substance, what you can't see inside of these accidents is now the body and blood of Christ. That's what they say happens in the Mass. So you consume what looks like bread and wine, but substantially you are consuming the body and blood of Christ. So Christ's actual body and blood are on the altar in the Mass. And of course, the priest elevates the host. He raises the bread, he raises the cup in this offering of Christ as the sacrifice. And his body and blood are in the bread and the wine. And again, as our catechism says, if Christ's body and blood are actually in the bread and the wine, he is therefore to be worshipped. If the Mass is true, they should worship the host and the chalice. If that's Christ's body there, present on the altar, they should be worshiping. Now, to be fair, they don't worship the actual bread and wine. They don't worship the accidents. They're worshiping the substance, they think, of Christ's body and blood. So they're worshiping Christ, they think, even though his outward appearance his body and blood have the outward appearance of bread and wine. So that's what's happening in the Mass, they think. But if Christ is not bodily present in the bread and the wine, if transubstantiation is not true, if the bread and wine remain bread and wine, well, now you're into condemnable idolatry, as question 80 says. They're worshiping the creation and not the creator. They're worshiping bread and wine. Jesus is not in there. So it's no different than bowing down before the golden calf. When they bowed, the Israelites bowed before the golden calf, they weren't worshiping a pagan god. They were worshiping Yahweh through this false idol. The same is true in the Roman Catholic Mass. They think they're worshiping the true God, but they're bowing before this idolatry of the host and the chalice. They also address the Mass, the Council of Trent does, in 1562, in session 23, chapter 2. Inasmuch as in this divine sacrifice, which is performed in the Mass, the same Christ is contained and immolated in a bloodless manner, who once offered himself in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross. The Holy Synod teaches that this sacrifice is truly propitiatory. The Mass is truly propitiatory. So the same sacrifice on the cross is now offered in the Mass. This is not a new sacrifice. Christ is not re-sacrificed, but the same sacrifice of the cross is represented in the Mass. Why do we reject crucifixes? A crucifix is not just a cross. A crucifix has the image of Christ on it. We reject them, of course, because they're second commandment violations, but also because Christ is no longer on the cross. 
of course, we shouldn't make images of Jesus. We shouldn't make an image of Christ in the manger as a baby. He's no longer in the manger. <clears throat> if you've seen uh, Talladega Nights with Will Ferrell, when he prays to baby Jesus, I've never seen the whole movie yet, but this clip has gone around in uh, reform circles for years. Ricky Bobby, Will Ferrell, prays to baby Jesus. And his wife says, you know, Jesus did grow up. You don't always have to call him baby. It's a bit odd to pray to a baby. She has good theology. <laughs> we don't pray to baby Jesus. He's not a baby. And we shouldn't make images of Christ on the cross either because the crucifixion is over. He's not on the cross. His suffering is over. Now he is victorious. He's been raised from the dead. He's ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God. He is not on the cross. So why would we make an image of him on the cross? If we were going to make an image of Jesus, and we weren't, but if we were, we should depict him at the right hand of God. That's where he is. That's a true representation of Christ at the right hand of God. That's where he is now. That would be more accurate than an image of the baby in the manger or an image of him on the cross. He's victorious now. Why would we put him back on the cross? But for Roman Catholics, they like crucifixes because for them, he's still on the cross. His sacrifice on the cross is represented in every mass. He is offered on the altar in every mass. And notice, as that Trent says, it is truly propitiatory. This is the turning away of the wrath of God. So the sacrifice on the cross that is represented in the mass, it actually satisfies, it turns away the wrath of God. It says Rome. But if that's true, what did Jesus mean when he said on the cross, it is finished? It wasn't finished. If the Roman mass is true. Because that sacrifice on the cross has to turn away God's wrath continually in every single mass. It must be propitiatory. It must turn away the wrath of God. But we believe he actually meant what he said. He finished the atonement on the cross. It was finished. It's over. So he's not represented on the altar. The mass does not turn away God's wrath. For those of us who are in Christ, for the elect, God's wrath is satisfied on the cross. That's it. It's over. No more propitiatory sacrifice. His wrath doesn't linger. His wrath is not temporarily satisfied in the Mass, but then comes back again before the next Mass. It's gone. The wrath of God has been poured out at the cross, and now we can rejoice in Christ's victory. So it's so tragic to think. Can you imagine thinking that God's wrath comes against you again and again and again? And so you must participate in the mass over and over seven days a week for God's wrath to be turned away from you, never to be finally satisfied. The Council of Trent goes on to say, if anyone shall say that in the mass a true and proper sacrifice is not offered to God or that to be offered is nothing else but that Christ is given unto us to eat, let him be anathema. So we who say that the Mass is not a sacrifice of Christ, we are anathema, condemned forever. Nothing has changed with Rome since the middle of the 16th century. Notice that question 80 mentions the living and the dead. The Mass teaches that the living and the dead have their sins forgiven in the Mass. Why the dead? Purgatory. The place of purging for those too impure for heaven, but those who are not bound for hell. This is the intermediate state. Christians pay the remaining temporal penalties of their sin before they can enter heaven. Some, they say, spend a short time in purgatory. Others spend thousands of years. And one way to shorten your time in purgatory is to have a mass celebrated in your name. So your family members, after you die, they go to the priest, they make a nice donation 
a math, mass is said in your name then, and now time, uh, your time in purgatory is shortened. This happens seven days a week. The Council of Trent goes on to say, If anyone shall say that the sacrifice of the Mass is only a sacrifice of praise and of thanksgiving, or that it is a bare commemoration of the sacrifice offered on the cross, but not a propitiatory sacrifice, now Trent there is attacking the Protestants. They understand Protestant theology. If you deny, or if you say that the sacrifice is only a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, that it is a bare commemoration of the sacrifice offered on the cross, but that it is not a propitiatory sacrifice, or if you say that it avails him only who receives, and that it ought not to be offered for the living and the dead, for sins, punishment, satisfaction, and other necessities, let him be anathema. So they correctly address Protestant theology, and they say, if you believe that, you are condemned forever. And so we, who are condemned by Rome, we say the Mass is a condemnable idolatry because it is a denial of the one sacrifice and suffering of Jesus Christ, as question 80 concludes. This question should not be controversial. We should not apologize for it. We should not make footnotes to it. We should not put brackets around it. It's just as true today as it was in 1563. Question 81, who should come to the Lord's table? Those who are displeased with themselves because of their sins, but who nevertheless trust that their sins are pardoned, that their remaining weakness is covered by the suffering and death of Christ, and who also desire more and more to strengthen their faith and to lead a better life. So in other words, repentant Christians should come to the Lord's table. Of course, none of us is worthy in and of ourselves to partake. One sin is enough to separate us from God forever, to condemn us to hell. But yet, Christ welcomes us to his table because he has offered this once-for-all sacrifice for sin. And so we come through the work of Christ. We come with broken and contrite hearts. We come repentant, grieving our sin, but trusting that Christ is the propitiation for our sin, that his sacrifice turned away God's wrath once for all. And notice that we should come, as question 81 says, desiring more and more to strengthen their faith and to lead a better life. And of course, the supper is one of the means, the ordinary means that God uses to do that, to strengthen, to nourish our faith, to empower us, to live lives of obedience and gratitude. And so we see at the end of question 81, hypocrites, those who are unrepentant, however, eat and drink judgment unto themselves. That's a reflection of what Paul says in verse 27, as we read, of 1 Corinthians 11. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So partaking in an unworthy manner turns the sacrament from a means of grace, from a sign and seal of the promises of Christ, into a sign of covenant breaking. And it is now a witness of your destruction. If Christ is not your sacrifice for sin, if you are not united to him, if you do not eat his flesh and drink his blood, as he says in John 6, you will be required to pay the debt that you owe. You will be cut off as Hebrews chapter 6 says. So hypocrites, those who are unrepentant, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So there are two types of people, repentant sinners and unrepentant sinners. That's anthropology. Repentant sinners, unrepentant sinners. We're all sinners, Christians and non-Christians. The only difference is some are repentant, others are unrepentant. Question 82, should those admitted, be admitted to the Lord's Supper who show by what they profess and how they live that they are unbelieving and ungodly? No, that would dishonor God's covenant and bring down God's wrath upon the entire congregation. So who should come to the table? Those who've made a credible profession of faith, those who have been united to a true church, those who are repentant, trusting in Christ alone for salvation. So we can't read people's hearts. We don't know for certain 
whether or not someone truly is in Christ. It's not foolproof, fencing the table. But Christ has given the keys of his kingdom, as we'll see next week, to the ministers and elders of the church to open and shut the gates of the kingdom of heaven. So he's entrusted them as best they can to ensure that only those are welcome to the table who've made a true profession of faith, who are united with a true church, who are genuinely repentant. Those are the ones who should be admitted to the Lord's table. One of the questions that comes up, what about children? Why don't we practice pedo communion? Why don't small children come to the Lord's table? Well, as we said, you must make a credible profession of faith. You must be repentant of sin. And some Reformed churches actually have children as young as two or three years old partake of the supper because they do make a profession of faith. They don't admit them apart from a public profession of faith, but they will receive a public profession of faith from children as young as two or three. Why don't we do that? Well, we see in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28, Paul says, Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So a person must examine himself recognizing the weight of his sin, the hopelessness to save himself. He must have a desire to repent and turn from his sin. He must examine himself to determine if he believes in Christ alone for salvation. All of this is entailed in examining himself. Can a two or three-year-old do that? And Paul says, someone who comes to the table must discern the body. Now, there are multiple interpretations of this phrase, discern the body. Some say it means discern Christ's body that's given for you on the cross. So you must understand the significance of Christ's sacrifice for sin. That's what it means to discern the body. could be. It could also mean you must discern Christ's body in the supper. How is Christ present for us in the supper? As we say, we partake of his true and natural body and blood by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's discerning Christ's body in the supper itself. Either way, children two and three years old typically don't have the capability of discerning the body of Christ. Whether that means the significance of his sacrifice on the cross or the presence of Christ in the supper, we don't typically see that in children of that age. Now, this doesn't mean that small children can't genuinely believe in Christ. It doesn't mean they can't be converted at a very young age. Of course, we believe that. They can be. Many small children probably do have repentance and faith. They're members of the covenant community, not only externally, but also internally of the heart. It does mean, though, that most small children can't articulate that sufficiently. God may have granted them repentance and faith. Can they communicate that in a clear way? Most often, no. And so the pastor and the elders can't welcome them to the table because they don't give sufficient evidence of being able to discern the body. And so we ask them to wait so that they don't eat, drink, eat and drink judgment unto themselves. Now, the other side, the error on the other side, we also want to avoid... We don't want to practice pedo communion, but some churches won't commune anyone under the age of 18. So we don't want to swerve into the error on the opposite side. Many covenant children under the age of 18 can make a credible profession of faith and discern the body. We have quite a few in our own congregation. So we would be foolish to go with this arbitrary age of 18 that our culture says is the cutoff for adulthood and make that a standard for coming to the Lord's table. It doesn't make any sense. We welcome all of those who make a credible profession of faith who are able to discern the body of Christ. All repentant sinners are welcome. And so we should take comfort when we come to the table as we read in our short form two that we should not allow the weakness of our faith 
or the failures in our Christian life to keep us from the table. So if you have a particularly bad week, you can't excommunicate yourself, as I've told you before. You have no authority to bar yourself from the table. If you believe you are in grievous sin, of course, communicate that to the pastor and the elders, but do not excommunicate yourself. Your weakness and failures should drive you to the table. As our form says, it's given to us because of our weakness and because of our failures. If we didn't have weakness and failures, we wouldn't need the supper. We would already have arrived at glorification. But God has gifted us with the supper to increase our faith by feeding us with the body and blood of Christ. So we come every Lord's Day. We come as repentant sinners, believing in God's promise, and we come trusting that through these ordinary means, Christ will strengthen and nourish our faith.